Welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to see um, several of our NEAR members as well as uh, colleagues from other RELs and friends. Today uh, we will provide uh, what we're calling a research in brief, a very uh, quick dip into a recent study that looked at teacher evaluation and professional learning, lessons from early implementation in a large urban district. Uh, our agenda for today is to um, hear from two of the primary researchers on this study, Dr. Karen Shackman, Dr. Jacqueline Zweig, researchers for the RHEL Northeast and Islands, who will walk us through the main findings of the study. And then we're delighted today to have um, the, the um, participation of Jerome Doherty, who's been a, a member of our NERA group and has uh, from Boston Public Schools. And he will comment on the findings and bring us some, some practitioner perspective. And then we really want to make sure that you all raise your questions and um, and your so be sure and put those in the chat in the lower left and um, and participate fully with your questions and comments. Um, as I mentioned, as you joined us at the opening, the Northeast Educator Effectiveness Research Alliance is the sponsor of today's event. Uh, near is goal is to provide research to support states and districts in their educator evaluation systems and to build states and districts capacity to evaluate their own systems and, and, and make continuous improvements to that by that uh, through, through data use. So um, just a reminder, please say hello in the chat, post your questions and at this point, I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Karen Shackman, who's been the NERA researcher and a key researcher on this study to walk us through the study um, background. Karen? Great. Thank you, Susan. Um, it's very nice to see folks joining. I see some folks who we have known for a while and some new folks. And please don't be shy about adding your observations, questions, and comments to the chat as we go along. I'll invite you that um, this is a short half hour, so don't wait till the end to post those questions, please, as things come to you. We'll capture those questions and, and try to address as many as we can. So why this study of educator evaluation and professional learning? First, policymakers and researchers have increasingly recommended that schools and districts align their educator evaluation and their professional development systems to improve instruction, student learning, and school capacity. We know that, and we've been hearing that for several years now. And the members of our alliance, the NERA members, were interested in the beginning when we started thinking about the kind of research that we would do. They were interested in the relationship of evaluation and professional development, and specifically what happens in that black box between evaluation cycles to address teachers' professional growth. In other words, teachers get a rating, some time goes by, and they get another rating. But what happens in between those ratings? And they wanted us to explore that question. So we focused on a large urban district where data would be available to investigate this relationship. The population that we focused in on were teachers who've been identified as needing improvement in one or more areas on their teacher evaluation rubric, and therefore have what the study district refers to as a prescription. This prescription is a formal way for the evaluator to prescribe activities. And you'll hear us use the word of prescribing or prescription. That's the language that we use throughout. But it, again, it's, it's the recommendations or the suggestions about the act that teachers should engage in. We began back in 2012 with a data catalog. Uh, a data catalog allows us to look at available data related to a general topic of interest in order to determine researchable questions related to that interest. So in this case, we had an interest in the relationship between evaluation and professional learning. Through our data catalog, we identified approximately 35 potential data sources in the district that related to six or seven key constructs associated with educator evaluation and professional learning and practice. And again, you can, you can think about sort of the, the timeline for doing this kind of work. We started with this data catalog in 2012 to zero in on a question, to zero in from this general question of interest related to the black box to a specific researchable question. The study district 
has a new evaluation system, or at the time of, it's getting less new as time goes on, although there are always tweaks and, and changes to it. But at the time of the study, they had a new evaluation system that included observations, self-assessments, and professional growth plans. And in this system, teachers are assessed across four standards of effective practice that you see here. These four standards include two instructionally focused standards, the one and two, curriculum planning and assessment, and teaching all students. A third standard focused on family and community engagement, and a fourth related to professional culture. For each of these standards, a teacher can earn one of four ratings, exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, or unsatisfactory. So those are the four ratings, and a teacher receives a rating on each of those four standards. Now, I mentioned this prescription process, but a little bit more about it. In this uh, district's evaluation system, uh, evaluators prescribe professional activities to teachers who've received a less than proficient rating, so the, the, uh, the two lower ratings on one or more of the standards. As a way to look at alignment between evaluation and professional development and support and get inside that black box of what happens between these summative evaluations, we zeroed in on this prescription process that the district employs. So, you know, again, we'll refer to this prescription process throughout, but it's really not dissimilar from other approaches such as professional growth plans or action plans that districts employ, especially for teachers who've been identified as in need of improvement. So as you listen uh, to our findings, we'll, uh, get, we'll refer to prescriptions, but think about it in your own context as the action plans or the professional growth plans and the kinds of um, guidance that, that teachers receive. So a little bit more about what's in the prescription that we analyzed. A prescription is tagged to a standard and indicator on the evaluation rubric. So for example, uh, a prescription might be tagged to the teach all students standard and within that standard to the indicator student engagement. It then states a problem that should align to that standard and indicator and provides evidence of that problem. So, a problem might be related to classroom management and engaging all students with specific evidence that the evaluator would draw from observations. And then it prescribes a set of actions that the teacher should take to address the problem. These prescribed professional activities are designed to support teachers' professional growth, and they might include trainings, formal coaching, reading materials related to an area of need, or the identification of distinct instructional strategies, to name a few of the kinds of actions prescribed. So for example, using this, the same example I've described above about student engagement, the evaluator might prescribe that the teacher employ a student engagement strategy such as think, pair, share in the classroom, and also prescribe that the teacher read and discuss a chapter from The Skillful Teacher, the book by John Sapphire. So that's just an example of um, thinking about what's in the prescription. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jacqueline Zweig, who's going to talk a little bit more about the research questions and the data sources for the study. Thanks, Karen. So for this study, we were interested in whether evaluators were identifying areas for improvement in all the standards, both that were instructionally focused and those that focused on professional practice and family and community engagement. In other words, in what standards did teachers receive prescriptions? And as Karen mentioned, the prescriptions outline a set of actions that teachers should take to improve their practice. The second question focused on understanding the types of actions evaluators were prescribing to teachers. Then we wanted to know what were teachers doing and whether there was alignment between what was prescribed by evaluators and what teachers were doing to improve their practice. In the, next, in the next slide, we show the final two research questions, and these aim to understand whether there are any patterns between this alignment and teachers' subsequent summative evaluation ratings. Oh. Um, we used several sources of data to address these research questions. We first examined the characteristics of the 586 teachers who received one or more prescriptions, meaning that they received a less than proficient rating in one or more standards. We then analyzed the full prescriptions for a stratified random sample of the 586 teachers. And so those full prescriptions included the evidence and the action steps um, and the standards and indicators. And through the data catalog process, we uncovered that the district did not systematically collect information about the professional development that teachers engaged in. 
Therefore, the district administered a survey to these teachers to capture the types of professional activities in which they participated related to each of the four standards on the professional practice rubric. A total of 248 teachers, which was 42% of the population, completed the survey. Respondents differed from the full population of teachers um, in that they were more likely to be older, white, and female. Otherwise, they were not significantly different from the non-respondents regarding the number of prescriptions they received or in what standards uh, they received those prescriptions. We also examined evaluation data to provide descriptive information about whether the alignment between what evaluators prescribed and what, pe what teachers did was related to teachers' subsequent summative evaluation ratings. Finally, we conducted interviews with six teachers and four principals about their experiences with the prescription process to provide some additional context. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Karen to talk about the findings. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and I saw that there was a question in the chat about access to the survey. Um, you'll see, and we mentioned this, but feel free at any point to download any of the files that you'll see to the right of the chat box. In the What's Happening publication, uh, we have the full content of the survey in the, as one of the appendices. So if you're interested in what exactly we asked, you can find them there. Uh, now a bit about the findings. So first, remember we were interested in whether prescriptions were given across all four standards. So teachers did receive prescriptions across all four standards. And the distribution of these was fairly evenly split across the four standards. As you'll see here, 49% of the 586 teachers received a prescription for standard one, 52% for standard two, with the fewest prescriptions in standard four, professional culture, only 34%. I find this to be valuable information. My colleagues and I, while we know this may not be a big finding, uh, think it's helpful to understand that the evaluators are identifying areas of need in all four domains of the rubric. Second, we identified 10 types of activities that captured what we saw across the prescriptions. On the next slide, I'll present these types. But we did observe that teachers received one to two types per prescription. This means that the evaluator sees a need in standard one and tells the teacher on average to do one or two types of things to address that need. While some prescriptions provide more types, the average number that we saw was one to two per prescription. As I said before, we coded the prescriptions according to these 10 types. And as you're looking at the screen, I imagine you're saying, I only count nine here. And that's right. You'll see nine here. But that's because the tenth was none. Uh, and very, very few of the prescriptions had no activities recommended. So in our analyses, we realized these types really fell into two general categories. Professional practice activities, you'll see on the left, and professional development activities on the right. For example, a professional practice activity might be to submit a document or engage in a particular strategy or activity in the classroom. A professional development activity might be to attend a course, participate in a coaching session, or meet with colleagues. And you'll see, again, you'll see that we've divided them into these two. And we have four types of activities under professional practice and five types of activities under professional development. What is notable is that evaluators nearly always prescribed these professional practice activities on the left. Between 97 and 100% of the prescriptions included professional practice activities, while they prescribed professional development activities in only about half of the prescriptions. As you'll see on the next slide, teachers reported that they did a lot of professional development, despite the fact that prescriptions were not calling for professional development. Here, and again, we have these visuals here. The, the first two are curriculum, uh, I don't have the language exactly right, curriculum planning and instruction, teaching all students, then family and community engagement, and then professional culture. So those are the four across the bottom. And here we found that for those teachers who responded to the survey, they reported doing more activities for the instructionally focused standards, those are the two that are circled, than the other standards, which were, again, the family and community engagement and the professional culture. These reported activities were both professional activities such as trying new classroom strategies and professional development, such as coaching, attending workshops, and the like. Now I'm going to hand it to Jackie, and she'll provide more information about what we learned about alignment and outcomes. Jackie? Great. Thanks, Karen. I keep, I keep double-clicking. Sorry, guys. 
Um, for the teachers who responded to the survey, less than 40% of them participated in all the activities that their evaluators prescribed. This means that, for example, um, while teachers may have been advised to attend a workshop or try a and try a particular strategy, at least 60% of them either did none of those recommendations, one of them, but not all of them. However, it should be noted that these teachers may have participated in many other activities that address the standard, just not those that were prescribed by their evaluators. And as we said, we looked at the subsequent evaluation ratings to see if any patterns emerged between participation in professional activities related to standards in which teachers receive prescriptions and subsequent improvements in evaluation ratings. We found that more teachers who participated in professional activities related to standard one received at least a proficient rating in this standard on their subsequent evaluation than did teachers with a prescription for standard one who did not participate in professional activities related to that standard. So let's look at the first two bars in the chart focused on standard one. For the blue bar, of teachers with a prescription for standard one who participated in any professional activities related to that standard, 64% received a proficient or higher rating for standard one on their subsequent evaluation rating. This is compared with the blue bar where only 38% of teachers who are rated at least where only 38% of teachers were, laid, were, were rated at least proficient in standard one, but did not participate in any professional activity for standard one, despite the fact that they received a prescription for that standard. Standard one is the only standard with a statistically significant difference. And it's important to note that this analysis is about any activity and not necessarily the prescribed activities. So I'm now gonna turn it back over to Karen to talk about implications. I'm going to stay on this slide for just one second and just clarify something with Jackie. So, so the blue bar that we're looking at, and it may be that our colors look different to us than they do to you, the 64% is the, in the standard one is the blue bar, and it's the black bar that's 38%. Is that right? Yes. That's, that's correct. Thanks, Karen. Yes. Yep. So, so and you'll see the, there's a bigger dip for that than you'll see for the others. So that, I just wanted to clarify that. As a, as a qualitative researcher, sometimes it's helpful to just see the visuals. So I want to just take a moment here uh, to talk about the implications of the study. And as is not surprising, uh, the study raised more questions than it answered, and certainly uh, raised questions for further investigation. First, do teachers and evaluators agree about what teachers should do to improve their practice? And do teachers have access to the right opportunities to address the needs that have been identified? Both these questions emerged out of this work. And the findings suggest there may be a disparity between what evaluators believe teachers need to do to improve their rating and the kinds of activities teachers themselves felt they needed to do, were able to do, or had access to. The findings also suggest, related to the third question we posed here, that evaluators may benefit from more training and guidance on the range of professional activities available to teachers and on how to write effective, actionable, and specific feedback that supports teacher improvement. So I am delighted that we have our, our friend of NERA and colleague, Jerome Doherty, from the Boston Public Schools, who will talk about, um, in the real world of his work, what the implications are of these findings um, and to the field at large. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Jerome, and ask you to share your thoughts. Great. Uh, can everyone hear? Can you hear me? Can, all right. Uh, Loud and clear. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, how our experience uh, with this uh, study uh, raised, again, more questions, but, but more uh, gave us some direction for the future and how that might apply um, more broadly uh, to our colleagues who may not be using the same system as we are. Um, so hopefully this will be um, some helpful, uh, helpful thinking for all of you. Um, one of the, one of the uh, indications of this study is that uh, to get the PD uh, aligned appropriately with the evaluation system, there really needs to be strong coherence uh, between the vision uh, of the district, the, its values, and the implementation on the ground of the evaluation system. And when we say evaluation system, uh, in BPS we're really talking about um, everything from expectations through support 
to accountability. It's not just the evaluation part of the process that we talk about when we talk about the evaluation system. Um, after our superintendent announced the district's uh, priorities, we have four of them uh, that we're focusing in on, uh, my office began working to see where they live uh, in the systems that support effectiveness and accountability, and then beginning to develop resources and professional learning opportunities. Uh, it should be noted, this is an interdepartmental effort um, and is likely much more complex an effort uh, the larger district you have. Um, another implication is uh, the focus on management, uh, on a management orientation uh, leaders ought to have, school leaders ought to have. Um, management of people uh, is uh, part of instructional leadership. Um, and so we're looking deeper into the, the discrete skills and tools school leaders need to have around effective management, including in particular the tools like a prescription bank uh, that they might access that are linked to the performance standards um, to provide good uh, examples uh, for evaluators to give to teachers. And then also training in coaching and feedback, um, uh, but also around creating the conditions for fair but firm accountability. And when I, when I say that, I mean um, including explicit follow-up when prescriptions are given, not just giving a prescription, but giving a thoughtful one that will be the focus of future coaching conversations and feedback. Um, and that's important too, um, and that, this relates back to um, Jackie's uh, slide 13, I think it was, uh, about teachers who participated in the PD after they were given the prescription. Follow-up is so critical, um, and, uh, and that is something that as a manager, the uh, principal or the, the school leader has to, be, um, has to have at top of mind. Um, this also brings up the, the principal's role, the role of the school leader. Um, we hear from our school leaders that managing the operational aspects of, of a school impinges on their ability to attend to the instructional aspects. I think this is probably fairly common. Um, this suggests that we should look at ways to enable leaders to focus on the instructional work. In BPS, uh, we have a number of models being tried, such as levering, leveraging assistant principals, creating new management roles, and using teacher leaders to distribute uh, leadership functions. Um, and so we're not, we're not trying a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, approach, but rather we're, we're trying to see what is working and what circumstances are most appropriate for those, uh, for those uh, uh, models. Um, then we need I infrastructure to support uh, the interconnections between the different components like evaluation systems, PD systems, training, uh, and so forth. Uh, we have a number of online systems uh, set up in Boston for all of these, but we need we recognize that we need to make sure that they uh, can all talk to one another uh, to make the most out of the available data. Um, so that's a that's a key consideration is if you have a number of systems, uh, you should be able to access the um, the data that they provide um, uh, in a readily uh, usable way to help with decision making around uh, you know, what might be difficult choices between professional development opportunities. Um, finally, what all this suggests is the need for a systems view uh, and a strong commitment uh, to sustaining the focus on it uh, going into the future. It's easy to take the eye off the ball when there is, uh, when there are you know, 10 different initiatives or, or projects uh, that we can be working on um, that have promise. Um, but really focusing in on ensuring that we have clear expectations that are aligned uh, to the systems uh, and to the supports um, for educators, we think is, um, is, is really critical. And with that, I think uh, I'll turn it back over to Karen, perhaps. Yeah, thanks, Jerome. Um, there's a quick question I see that I can answer, and then I'd, I'd like to pose a question back to you, Jerome. Um, Judy had asked about whether or not the professional learning that teachers participated in was rated as high quality or highly effective. So, you know, we were looking at alignment, but how, I, I'm reading between the lines that Judy is interested in. How do we know whether or not it's even good stuff that they're doing? And, and mm -hmm. the honest answer is that the, the research that we did did not examine the quality of learning opportunities. That was not an aspect of our research. Um, 
so we sort of take for granted a few things in the study. Uh, we take for granted that the kinds of um, that the way teachers are being rated in terms of what what is being identified as an area needing improvement is accurate, and we take for granted that the professional development that they're participating in um, is is we actually we don't make a decision about the quality of it. We're not really looking at that. So again, we're not. It's not a study that's examining the quality. It's really a study that's looking at alignment. Um, we do think that what this research does is suggest the need for um, for uh, understa ways to measure quality. So, and that's actually a good segue. I think Jerome, to for you to talk a little bit about how, as a district, um, you've been working on improving the quality of of these prescriptions. Um, and how sure. you help leaders to improve their, their assessment of teacher performance and the kinds of feedback they provide. Absolutely. We, began, uh, we began this work uh, with, uh, actually with another um, study that uh, helped us to arrive at what we believe are criteria for the underlying cr conditions of an effective prescription, um, a, a rubric, a prescription rubric, uh, if you will. Uh, and uh, these underlying conditions, while they don't get us all the way to quality, um, we believe are, um, uh, are critical components. Uh, examples of these criteria include tying the uh, tying the prescription to uh, specific evidence and also linking the, that evidence and that prescription to a specific um, indicator and element in the rubric uh, is one example uh, of, of a critical criteria. Specificity um, based on evidence uh, rather than generalization. Um, this is this is one criteria of, of many we came up with, but it's important to sort of remember when you're training evaluators that these are things that should be that should go into every prescription. Um, now, how we get to quality beyond that, um, we think is a little trickier because um, circumstances on the ground may be different. Uh, the the classroom. Uh, uh, setting may be different and may require more a more nuanced prescription than uh, uh, than another um, so getting to quality from uh, the underlying conditions for quality uh, is something we really judge by the results uh, and and did it work um, is it appropriate for the students um, in question and the setting in question. So there's a number of uh, there's a number of questions beyond basic criteria that we would want to take into account. Um, I think that is for Boston. That's the, that's our next level of work. We've gotten to this basic uh, criteria for success, um, and now we want to uh, take it to the um, to the quality question. And what we're beginning to do this year is uh, as I mentioned, develop a prescription bank um, where we have tested prescriptions for given content areas uh, and grade bands that uh, have been proven to work, um, and and we're going to begin compiling those uh, internally and uh, as starting point for high the question of high quality prescriptions. Yep, and that's great because I think that answers Scott's question about um, the database. So I think it's accurate to say that it, that's a work in progress and that you're working on collecting and sorting and creating this, this database or this bank of prescriptions. Um, so more to come on that, we hope. Uh, there was a question from Anne-Marie, and I'll take this question and then we'll have to say thank you and goodbye, um, about using professional learning communities in a PD continuum. Um, Anne-Marie, I think uh, if you're able to look at the report, you'll see that we've characterized the different kinds of professional development a number of different ways. Um, there may have been references in some of the prescriptions to professional learning communities. It's not a category, um, but it may fall into a larger category that we had for meetings with colleagues. Um, I don't think we have time right now to talk at more length about professional learning communities, but we certainly saw across the data that we looked at that PLCs were 
one of the kinds of recommendations that were made to teachers. Um, with that, with the idea that this is a research and brief, this is only a 30-minute uh, presentation. We hope that you will download this information. There's an infographic. There's actually a video, uh, a short, there's the short overview of the study. Uh, and there's a, both a what's happening report and a stated briefly. Um, we don't want you to go without letting us know uh, how this was for you and if you have any feedback for us on this presentation. So please don't, you know, please don't hesitate to give us your honest feedback on this event. Um, and I want to be sure that we thank uh, Jerome Doherty for joining us today. And again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send them our way, and we will be sure to answer them. Uh, so with that, I want to say thank you for uh, giving us a half hour of your time, and we hope this was helpful for you. And again, Jerome, thanks so much for joining us, and Jackie and Susan, and we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.